very much. It's an honor. And I want to quickly say that we want this presentation to be accessible. So. Wait, Michelle. Michelle. Oh, it's not on? Okay. It is. There you go. There we go. So we really want the presentation to be accessible. And so that means that if people want to stand up and walk around, if people want to look on their phones, if people want to knit, whatever you want to do to make it accessible to you is fine with us. Also, if accessibility is a shared project, if you happen to see on the captioning screen that the captioner cannot keep up, or if she's missing something because speech is too quickly, please stop us, okay? And we would like the interpreters to stop us as well. In addition, if we're using vocabulary or language that's inaccessible to you, please let us know, because we believe that access starts in this room. You know? So we're going to continue now with our presentation, and Jamie will start. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's do this. Okay, um, so, so I'm Jamie, and I'm a city planner and an engineer, and I work right now with the Department of Transportation um, for New York City. And what we wanted to do today was talk Excuse a little, me. yes? It would help me if you didn't stand Come. in front of the presentation, if you could stand over can there. I, is it over here? One spot. Right here? One, yeah, that's good. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> can you guys see him okay? <laughs> Sorry, um, so thanks. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit, we've, there's been a lot of mechanics and a lot of details about um, websites, about, about virtual spaces, some about physical spaces. We're gonna talk a little bit more meta, uh, higher narrative about urban India and how accessibility is accomplished or um, kind of talked about there. Um, Michelle is an anthropologist, she focuses on um, on people with deafness, um, a lot of our, her, our work has been in um, in Bangalore and in Delhi, in India, and um, she's at Stony Brook, looking at working on disability studies at, through their um, their medical. Say, say a bit about your program. So I'm a medical anthropologist, which means that I. Um, work with sign language using deaf people and physically disabled people and I don't look at disability as a medical condition but rather as a social, cultural, political and economic project and process that people engage in and I'm interested in thinking about the stakes of being disabled um, and deaf and um, I want to say that one of the things that I think is really important is that we don't only look at disability through a negative lens. That is, we don't only look at it as creating stigma or marginalization or other types of negative affect. You know, and increasingly, disability has become a source of value in modern India and elsewhere. And I want to note that by value, I mean something that's not always positive value and stigma can often be very much related. And so when we see companies like Walmart or The Gap um, or Starbucks hiring disabled people and using them as greeters, and it creates a feel-good affect around disability, it's always important to think about who is benefiting from this discussion of disability. You know, who is benefiting from this discussion of accessibility? You know, it's, it's very interesting because all of the discussions that we've been having today have been about accessibility with this sort of abstract user in mind. You know, and I always want to think about, you know, who is the user? Who is this person or this group of people that you're talking about? You know, um, and so it's really important for us in our work, for Jamie and I, to think about the ways that Disability, A, is not always negative, you know, and that is not always perceived negatively, and B, the question of who is benefiting, you know. So we're going to talk a little bit about access and accessibility in India. But before I do that, I want to say that Jamie and I have spent time talking about accessibility, and we still do not have a definition, you know. And I have to say that, you know, after sitting in this room for so many hours, 
I feel even more confused about what the definition of accessibility is. You know, and I see accessibility often functioning as a discourse. That means just something that circulates and we're talking about it. And it sort of encapsulates a lot of things. So when Phoebe was talking earlier about accessibility, you know, and inaccessibility, I thought to myself, maybe she should be talking about oppression or structural violence. You know, there was a way that her discussions of accessibility were actually masking, perhaps, very real structurally violent processes. You know, so that's just something to think about. What do we mean when we talk about accessibility? You know, and am I talking too quickly or you're OK? Good. You're good? OK. Um, so um, in India, um, it's really important. So India has a Persons with Disabilities Act that was passed in 1995 that was modeled after the Americans with Disabilities Act. And unfortunately, the Indian Act did not apply to the private sector. It only applied to the public sector. And that means that when disabled people are out in the world circulating through malls, um, airports, well, airports are, pu are public. But just in general, when we think about private spaces, the law doesn't apply to private spaces. You know, so that law was passed in 1995, and so, let me just finish the about this. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this this PWD Act is really interesting. Just it's it's very vague. It uses the concept um, and language disability friendly, and so if you think of something like the Americans with Disabilities Act or all these, these guidelines and standards, they're, they're pretty concrete in terms of what you have to do and what are the repercussions if you don't do them. So this law that was passed in India was one very general and did not have a real regulatory framework behind it. And so a lot of the this kind of aspirational language of what government offices should you know, want to do, but it didn't really put anything in place to get there. Um, what was actually the first kind of mechanics that came into play were when, um, was when Stephen Hawking was invited to India or chose to visit India, and specifically in, in New Delhi, where there's many historical landmarks uh, that he wanted to visit. So the central government of India, New Delhi is the capital, went out of its way to provide portable ramps for Mr. Hawking to visit all of these you know, historic, beautiful facilities things they had, would not even think of doing for citizens, but because there's this important visitor they were going to do. And then as soon as he arrived and left, they were going to take the ramps down, most of which they did. But at that point in 2001 was really when like a disability advocacy movement was born, trying to you know, make sure that they're enforcing the laws that are on their books about making spaces, um, public spaces accessible. Well, what was what was also really interesting was disability activists living in Delhi at the time, they really wanted Stephen Hawking to go everywhere. You know, they said, we really want him to go everywhere because then something will happen. You know, we have an international person coming here and it's making the state look bad. You know, and the state didn't want to look bad and so it installed these portable ramps, which they then removed. But it really points to often the role that international pressure can play in creating you know, disability focus in the so-called developing world. I mean, India signed the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Do people know what that is? So it's considered, this is a United Nations treaty that's considered the Human Rights Treaty of the 21st century. It goes further than all the other human rights treaties in providing for social, political, <coughs> and economic rights for disabled people. And more than 140 countries around the world have signed this. And it's an international treaty that is supposed to be binding, but it's unclear how binding it actually is. But India signed it in 2007. And so after that, disability activists have been trying to get the state to update and to harmonize the law on the books with the UNCRPD. Because the UNCRPD goes much further than 
the, um, the currently existing disability law. And so it's interesting to see what's happening now because there's been a lot of movement in India as there have been in other countries around the world saying, look, you know, you signed the UN CRPD, so now you need to actually implement it. You know, and so this is something that I think those of you who are interested in access um, and disability on a global level should definitely be aware of. Another issue in India has to do with the census and actually how do we include disability in the census. So there's been a lot of discussion recently about what kinds of question census takers should be asking. And the Washington group has come up with a series of questions, but those questions are very specifically um, related to questions of function. So do you have trouble walking? Do you have trouble seeing? Do you have trouble hearing? Do you have trouble, um, well, actually, those are the questions. And so people are saying, so people are saying that, well, those are very medical model questions. They're not really looking at participation. And so the question is, what are the questions that you even ask to get disability included in the, you know, in your statewide representation? You know, how do we do a disability, so-called disability inclusive census? Um, so those are some of the things that are happening. So right now in India, especially in urban India, there's a lot of discussion about advocacy and the implementation of the UNCRPD and also how to get disability counted. Um, do you want to say something? No. And so I think what's really important is, you know, so we had the UN Decade of Disabled persons in the Asia and Pacific area in 1993 to 2002. Prior to that, there was the United Nations dec uh, Decade of Disabled People in general, right? So the UN's been focusing on disability, and you know, we're really seeing disability as a category for state intervention. You know, so if you look at what's been happening around the Millennium Development Goals, you know, and then with the SDGs, with the Sustainable Development Goals, there's been a lot of focus on disability. There's a very strong disability lobby. A lot of government are focused on funding um, disability-specific programs. Um, and we're really seeing the emergence of disability as a category for state intervention. And then at the same time, in India and elsewhere in the world, we're seeing the emergence of neoliberalization and private sector leadership. What that means is, increasingly, states happen to be playing a smaller role in the, in the provision of services and in providing access. You know, we're seeing the emergence of public-private partnerships, and those public-private partnerships are increasingly responsible for doing the work of the state, even in the realm of disability. And then it brings up questions, you know, so if we're talking about India, but the question of what kind of access standards or guidelines should India be using? You know, are there universal access guidelines that people should be using? Or should they be made locally specific to specific times, places, and countries? You know, one of the things that disability rights activists in India really like to talk about is bathrooms, right? And they really like to show pictures, or not all, but some. They really like to show pictures of bathrooms in Japan. So, you know, Japanese bathrooms that are beautiful and clean, and they have Completely nice- automated every single feature with um, spray sense on the button commands. <laughs> They're wonderful. Yeah, and so the question is, you know, is that something that will work in India? You know, or, you know, are standards here what they should be in other countries? You know, how do we develop locally specific standards? Or should we? I don't know, but that's the question. You know, access as a concept tends to get universalized, right? So we tend to think, okay, you know, the ramp slope is this in America, the ramp slope should be the same in India. You know, or the ramp slope should be the same in Japan. But should it be? We, that's something that we've been thinking a lot about, you know, this idea of universalization of access standards and what the stakes of are that. Um, and so very quickly, you know, in India, as I was worried, there, could, there can be said to be two competing or overlapping models for thinking about disability. So the medical model with a focus on rehabilitation fighting and eliminating disability, 
you know, focused on cure, and then also claims for entitlement. You know, so when people say, when disabled people say what they want, they say, you know, we want a government uh, reservation, we want access to jobs in the government um, sector, we want higher education. But these are all things that have been provided within the law, you know, so they become their entitlement, you know. Um, and so people often, you know, if you talk to people on the ground, both in urban areas and in rural areas, they rarely talk about accessibility. You know, I'm working with a colleague right now who um, is doing field work in Indian villages and in second and third tier Indian cities. And she's been doing um, focus groups and having conversations with disability leaders and activists, and they're not talking at all about accessibility. You know, that's not a word that they use, and there's not even a translation to Indian languages for that word. What they're talking about is entitlement. You know, they want, you know, a pension. They want a job. You know, they want um, education. You know, and so those are things that's very different than talking about accessibility. You know, um, and so it's really only in, the, in these urban centers where we see a lot of international influence, where there's a lot of discussion about accessibility. You know, and I think that that's something that we really need to think carefully about. You know, this is a language, you know, that's developed presumably in the West that is now spreading, you know, the language of accessibility. What does it mean, you know? And then also, when you say that something is inaccessible, you know, what kind of claim are you making? You know, presumably, you're making other people feel bad. You know, that's inaccessible. And so people feel bad when they hear that, you know. So, but then what actually happens? You know, what does what the language of accessibility do on the ground? Um, then, um, so one of the things that Jamie and I did when we were in India was we worked with uh, cross disability groups who were engaged in what they call access audit. So what you would do is you would have a group that was comprised of people with different disabilities and they would go out to different public spaces like a train station, a bank, a passport office, or another kind of space and they would conduct an access audit, which would mean that they would go through the space, they would mark all the things that were inaccessible, although they didn't use the language of accessibility, but you know, the things that didn't work for them. And then they would write a report and they would submit it to the government. You know. And what was interesting was there were different kinds of groups doing access audits. So on one hand, there were lay disabled people who didn't have training and they were essentially using their bodies to conduct access audits. So you know, a person <coughs> who used a wheelchair would go to the bathroom if they couldn't get in, the bathroom wasn't accessible. You know, another person who was a little person went to the water fountain. If she couldn't use it, it wasn't accessible. You know, so they were using their bodies to see whether things were accessible or not. You know, on the other hand, we've seen the emergence of a internationally trained sort of access audit sector or accessibility sector. So these are people who went to the UN training, who got international help, and they would do professional access audits. You know, and they would look down often on the lay people doing access audits, and they would say, they're not trained, they're not professional, you know, they're just using their bodies. And then the people, the lay people would say, but they're not disabled often, or they don't really know what it's like on the ground. So it became an interesting question of, you know, who has expertise in talking about access and who has expertise in deciding when things are accessible or not accessible. You know, and then what, again, what access standards and guidelines do we use? You know, and one thing we noticed was that the people, so the lay disabled people who participated in access audits, they actually became quite, quote unquote, emp um, empowered, you know, because they were using their bodies you know, to generate a body of knowledge, right? So they went from their bodies to a body of knowledge. They were able to make authoritative claims using their bodies, you know. 
And yet nothing really happened. The state didn't make any changes, but as activists, they felt like they had achieved something, you know. And also going out in public space when it's not so-called accessible is very much a transgressive practice often. You know, just being out in public space is transgressive. Um, so one thing that we wanted to quickly point about to point out was um, right now in India, the, the Prime Minister, um, Prime Minister Modi, has really been focusing on Modi MODI. Yeah, he's really been focusing on accessibility. He started an accessible India campaign, you know, and it's been all over the media, all over the news. You know, there are pictures everywhere. Um, this is a picture of the Prime Minister with. A, um, a blind uh, high school student, perhaps, and perhaps her mother, and he's handing over a tablet, like a smartphone, and she's beaming and looks very happy, and he also looks quite pleased. And so, you know, disability has become a very important place for him, the prime minister, to locate his work because he's very contentious in other aspects of life. So, you know, he can't talk about caste, he can't talk about religion, he can't talk about um, other forms of politics, but he can talk about disability because it's presumably apolitical, you know. Um, so there's interesting things happening. Uh, again, you know, who's benefiting from disability? You know, who's, um, you know, and who's benefiting from this talk about accessibility? So he has an Accessible India campaign, but he hasn't signed and ratified the new law that disability activists have been waiting for, you know. So he's talking about accessibility, but he's not talking about rights, perhaps. You know, or he's talking about accessibility, but he hasn't signed a law into act. Um, so, um, and this, Jamie, would you like to tell us about this picture? No, I just thought it was, it was a good contrast. I think this is the picture, this is one of the ramps that they had for Stephen Hawking to get up to, um, this is the Red Fort, the ancient Mughal fort in, in New Delhi. And, it just is, is kind of striking in terms of the simplicity, but just the, um, that's, that's kind of all there is. And that's what they did for a foreigner. Um, so I think what we can do here is I wanted to, to take this like larger discussion and kind of bring it back to, to the US, bring it back to New York City. And I work for the Department of Transportation. I am a mobility management coordinator. And I'm, I'm not here representing them. But um, if there's, we are looking to kind of engage more with um, technology developers, engage more with people that are concerned about making civic technology services usable for, for all citizens. Um, and wanted to just kind of open it up for questions either about the discussion on India and or if there's issues that, that you see here in the city or about um, transportation and access that are that you feel are important to, to bring up at this time. Or if you want to define access for us, or if you want to have yeah. a discussion <laughs> about what accessibility means, that would be great too. Yeah. networks of um, there is there are visible advocacy groups and um, that we could reach out to and kind of network with and find people who are interested in that sort of activity a lot of it was kind of word of mouth also with these NGOs it's very contentious even even if there's not resources that they're fighting for they're fighting for kind of respect amongst the community and so a lot of times it was pulling 
people from various resources, various groups, um, but the idea of, of stigma and kind of uh, identifying yourself as having a disability is is significant. Uh, do you say something more yeah. about stigma well, well, in our well, people um, we work with? Well, well, first of all, I should say that I work, uh, as a researcher, I work mostly with lower middle class to middle class, um, sometimes poor Indian, and I actually don't see stigma operating on the ground. I see people out and struggling to be outside, you know, and I feel very strongly that this idea of stigma is something that's very much propagated by international NGOs in an attempt to raise funds, you know. Um, and so I should say that I was working with as a researcher with an NGO that was working with the government to do these audits. So the government would tell the NGO, please do an audit of this site, and the NGO would get a group of people together to do the audit, and I would go with them. You know, and it was considered to be a very fun activity for people, you know, because again, they were using their bodies to create a body of knowledge. They were using their bodies to, to, mark, to sort of reflect and to demand expertise. The, I mean, stigma is, is really interesting. I, I don't know that I know enough about it to say too much authoritatively, but um, we only saw a certain segment of people that inter interacted that were kind of attached to these NGOs, that were interested in contributing, that, that had either enough resources or abilities to be out in the community. Um, a lot of the people we saw were people who were deaf, and they were very mobile. Of course, communication is a huge problem. But in terms of being able to participate, to leave their home, to ride the bus, to take the auto rickshaws, to make it to these spaces, they could do that. Um, people that we saw with wheelchairs, with power wheelchairs. Were, we didn't see any people with power wheelchairs. Uh, we, we, we saw some, but it's that concept is, is one, it's a power wheelchair is, would only be used by someone in, in like a very high class. Um, someone whose family could afford it, someone who would have the resources, not just for the chair, but for the batteries, for the maintenance. Um, I know that there, there are a lot of people that we just couldn't interact with based on how deep we could go. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think that it's, it's still there, but she's the anthropologist, and I'm the city planner, so you probably should take her word for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the other thing I just wanted to quickly say about access standards, somebody recently mentioned an app um, who was it who mentioned the app where you could go around, you can mark whether things were accessible in New York City or not? Oh, yeah, so it's really interesting because, you know, this whole question of who gets to decide whether things are accessible or not. So in the U.S., you know, I've written to Yelp and I've complained that, you know, you've let people mark that this is accessible, but it's not, right? So the question is, you know, who has the expertise to decide that something is accessible or not? I think it's really important. I mean, in India, um, there was this accessible travel company that marked a store, a, a popular store as being accessible. And what happened was a foreigner went and there were two, three steps, right? But the store was willing to bring clothing outside for her to buy. And so they thought that that was, you know, a reason for it to be marked accessible. But the foreigner was outraged. She said, this isn't accessible by any means, you know? So again, competing definitions or competing like standards is, of access. Is, what is a reasonable accommodation? And that definition of reasonable accommodation, of course, varies by you know, your social construct. Okay. Did you want to add? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was just in terms of uh, who is the expert on what's accessible for people with disabilities, um, I think the most important thing to look at is speaking with people with disabilities, <laughs> because there's nothing more important than lived experience. Mm -hmm. That those are the experts, mm -hmm. uh, for sure, and and um, and I think a really important thing to look at when we're doing site surveys and of assessing accessibility isn't just uh, physical features, but also um, <coughs> how well staff are trained to serve people with disabilities. For instance, if you go into a, a pizza place, it could be the most accessible place in the world, but if the, the waitress will not take your order from you because she, if you, if she assumes you can't speak for yourself because you have a visual impairment she, and, she, and she orders from your friend instead of you, then it's not accessible at all. Um, so I think just 
when we're, we're, when we're creating a, lit, a survey guide. I, and, and to make this, and one really important point is that these sites exist, right? There are sites that list, that list and rate accessible venues throughout the city. The, the biggest problem is, is people doing surveys. So if you don't have, it's like going to Yelp and looking up a restaurant, and, but there's only one restaurant listed and it's 200 miles from you. So if you, if, you don't, if, the, if you don't have enough people going out and doing these site surveys, then you don't have the data to make a, a website that's actually useful for people. So um, it's about doing um, mapping projects and getting the disability uh, movement uh, going on this. We gotta get more people involved and, and doing this work is very important. But I think we also have to allow for competing understandings of access, right? So what you said in terms of working with the disability community, yeah. But you might hear five different things from five different people, and they might compete with each other, yeah. right? And so one has to be aware of that and be aware of that one person's access is not another person's access, and that accessibility, again, is not a universal thing. You know? Question. Yeah. Uh, As someone not from New York City, I'm just curious if you're able uh, to talk a little bit about what kind of stuff that is there a team of folks working on making sure digital services can be accessible to your folks just Um Yes. So we have we have a, a small team in mobility management who is looking at all kind of all of our services as a Department of Transportation. Where are our sidewalk projects? Where are our plaza projects? Where are our transit assistance projects? And what we, we kind of look deeply at demographic data to see how those projects fit. In terms of digitally, we are look, passing all of our documents through um, the mayor's office on, on disability um, to, to do some, some basic checking. We also are running um, if it's PDFs that we're sharing with the public, if it's websites, we're run doing you know basic, basic accessibility checks to make sure that all like the key steps that you guys talked about are are covered. Um, I, I think we could be doing better, and that's where we need to like hear hear from folks if there's documents or services or particular applications that are challenging certain ways that we've that we've missed um, we want to go back and and kind of address those the best we can right because with all the digital services going on in all the, all the city sure. everyone wants to make their city digitally mm -hmm. accessible in a larger sense right there's they have a definition of accessible um, but i'm concerned about uh, how cities uh, many cities aren't really proactively working on that specifically like there's so many mobile apps out there that are going on for different city services and, and websites where people are directed to transact with the city through there and yeah but uh, what you told me it's, it's good to hear you folks are doing you know doing what you can well, we have we have our department there's also someone who is um in the policy group um camelo arroyo who's focused just on kind of policy and disability access. In mobility management, we're looking more broadly. Right. Okay. Great. I'm going to pause there. Um, thank you so much, Jamie and Michelle. This is great. Thank you. So we're gonna we're gonna take just thirty seconds this time. We're gonna basically segue into the next presentation. So if, if you need to step out, please go ahead. But um, we're not gonna take the full ten minutes this time. We're just gonna take a minute or two to let Patrick set up next. Um, he's gonna be presenting on blind hackers. I'm super excited about this as a developer. So um, yeah, stick around, and uh, we'll hear more in a moment. Thanks.